do, but I sure get pumped up when I come in here and listen to singing taking place. You know what? I feel like we've got a mini concert going on right here. Well, I got my orders today from Nick. <laughs> he told me that the Chiefs play at noon. <laughs> Just so you'll know, I have a DVR that records it. <laughs> so, uh, relax, Nick. You're invited over after church, okay? <laughs> my goodness! It's January... Two. It's 10 degrees outside. January 2, 2022. Happy New Year! Yeah! All right. You know, I was thinking about, does anybody in here remember this thing they called 2020? Oh, my word. It was the year we thought, this is never going to end. It's just horrible. Well, then 2021 come around. You know, and I did see that there were some good things happen. Now, don't misunderstand me. There were some babies born and some, some folks got married and, you know, some kids graduated school. Some, some good things happened. But I have to tell you, I feel like with 2021, things may have just piled a little deeper at my house instead of getting better. So I'm thinking 2022 is going to be pretty amazing. Something new, something new. You know, that's what I'm looking for. So I got to thinking about celebrating um, New Year's. And I thought, you know, there, there's, a, there's a group starting out calling themselves the Genesis Group. And I think Caitlin's going to share a little information on that later. Okay, But I got to think about what would it be like to celebrate New Year's from Jesus' perspective? Right after, say, a couple of hundred years after Genesis. You know, the creation's kind of got settled in. You know, the animals have all been fed. Things are going on. And can't you just see Jesus up there in heaven? Okay, God. Hey, Dad, is this the year I get to go? No, not yet. No, wait another year. Okay, it's been, okay, it's year 101. Okay, God, is this the year I get to go? No. Uh, so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, when you, when you get a picture, when you hear the word Jesus, when you talk about Jesus, when you think about him, you get a picture in your mind of him. Because I, th I bet most of us do. Uh, so I was thinking about that, that mind's eye picture, and I, and I thought that maybe we would take a look at that mind's eye picture a little bit from a different perspective and, and, and think about it a little bit. So when, when, you, when you think about Jesus and, and who he is, if you've studied a little bit, I bet you, you feel like, I got a good grasp on him. I know it. I, when he was here on earth, maybe you read a little bit. So, you, so I ask you, if I was asking you, you know, all the places he went, all the things that he did. Maybe, maybe not. You know, while he was here, what was going on? Why, for example, if someone was asked, why did he come into the world? I mean, that's what we just celebrated. Why did he come into the world? Well, I think that today I'd like to talk about, I think he came into the world to bring something brand new. New. Brand new. He didn't come, Jesus didn't come to extend, make longer, something that we had, Okay. He didn't come, to, for example, some of us, when we pick up our Bible, we have an, an Old Testament and a New Testament. So some folks might think, well, Jesus came so we could have both Testaments. We'd have a complete Bible, you know, something new. And, and I was thinking about something new. And, and here, oh, a few months back, we, we've got this little app on the phone that we use as elders. And I'll bet you use these two, these little chat things that you talk back and forth. We have this little app and, and our little group, we call them elders. And so whenever you talked in that little app and typed something in there, you, didn't, you could speak into it, I guess, because I think it would record. But most of the time you could type something in there and all the elders got it. It was so cool. Kent helped us set that up and we liked it. But we had a problem. One of the elders here a while back decided that he, was, he and his family, they moved, moved out of the area and uh, they're doing fine. That's terrific. That's, that's not the problem. The problem was he continued to get all the chats, okay? <laughs> and he's like, guys, I don't need to know whether the furnace is on the church or not, you know? And so he, he was kind of wishing we would get him out of that group. And then one of the other elders got a new phone. So he said, I'm not getting it now. I want to get in the group. So one of our monthly elders meeting was centered around getting this app to work. Well, after many tried and true methods of realizing we didn't know what was going on, we just created Elders 2.0. <laughs> so now, whenever it beeps, if it's Elders, I don't pay attention to it. It doesn't mean anything. 
if it's Elders 2.0, I know something going on. So we got one out, the new one in, and we're, we're rocking and rolling. You know, Jesus didn't come to create Judaism 2.0. He didn't come to take what was already there, take some of it out, put some of it in, and rename it and call it Judaism 2.0. Jesus came to introduce something, to bring something that was brand new. Brand new. And, and, I, and I, th I think that he brought it not only to the world, it's, it's what's important to recognize, but he brought it here for the world. What Jesus brought here to the world was for the world. I, I was thinking about how, have you ever been to a, I mentioned concert here a while ago, so concerts are kind of on my mind. It's kind of things people do in the winter. But have you ever been to a, or, or attended some big event, some big rally or concert or happening, or maybe even been to the fair for that matter, and before the main act comes on the stage and does whatever they're going to do, gives their presentation, does their singing, or their group comes out and plays, whatever's going on, it's quite often that they have a, a warm-up act come on and do that. So I'm warning if I'm the warm-up act for James for next week right now, you may be thinking. But Jesus had a warm-up act. Jesus had a warm-up act. I got to think about that. Uh, so can't you just, just imagine... Coming to you from the river basin, Jordan River Basin, draped in animal skins and eating wild locust and honey, John the Baptist. Can't you just see it? Oh my goodness, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, you've heard, you've heard those words before, John the Baptist. Why didn't they call him John the Episcopalian? Why didn't they call him John the Presbyterian? John the Lutheran or the Methodist. Why does he have to be called John the Baptist? Poor fella. Well, there's actually a reason. There's a reason, perhaps, that he was called John the Baptist. You see, John, John may have been the first person. Now, listen to me all the way through. He may have been the first person to actually put his hands on somebody and dunk them, immerse them, to baptize them. He may have been the first person to done that. Well, now you say, well, wait a minute. Baptism was around long before John got there. It was. In fact, in the Jewish religion, baptism was a very common thing. Baptism, if in fact, if you were a Jew and you weren't ceremonially clean and you wanted to get to go to, to worship service to, to the sanctuary or to the tabernacle, you might have to baptize, but you baptized yourself. You washed yourself. You got into a basin and you washed yourself to get clean so that you could go to church, go to their, not church, but to the, to the synagogue or the temple. The, the, the element of baptism in this, in this culture, in this time period, though, that was, we would more recognize and was actually more... Uh, understood as baptism was, was for, if someone was outside of the Jewish religion, and that was everybody who was not a Jew, okay? That means 99.99% of the world out here were Gentiles, and only the little nation of Jew was, was God's chosen people. So you were a Gentile if you were anywhere out there. It wasn't uncommon for people to look at the Judaism faith and realize there's something there that I want to participate in. I like what they do. They, they, they practice love. There is, there's some good things about Judaism. So people would convert from being a Gentile, a non-Jew, and becoming a Jew, becoming in this, in this process. And you could, there was a conversion of it. So this non-Jewish person could become a Jew if they did some certain things. There was a, there was a, a relationship that started to happen. There was, a, there was a meal that they had to eat, a certain type of a meal they eat. There were certain... Uh, things that they learned and, and quoted and could do. But part of the process of converting from this Jew, Gentile to being a Jew was you got baptized, okay? There was a, a ceremonial washing that happened. But this, in this ceremonial washing, that person was saying, I'm dying to my Gentileness, I'm dying to my Gentile self, and I'm gonna be alive as a Jew, okay? When you got permission, when the time was right, you could do that. You could go wash yourself, you could immerse yourself, and you, could be, you would baptize yourself, and you would be ceremonial clean. No one was there, and no one was touching you. So think about this for a minute. So here's John the Baptist, John the baptizer. He's, he's in the Jordan River, and he's actually taking a hold of people, holding on to them, touching them, and, and that's how he got the name John the Baptist or John the baptizer. That's how the name came about. So... I was thinking about John a little bit, and there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each one of those write from a different perspective about the life of Jesus. But there's something at the beginning of the book of Luke that I want us to kind of hone in here for a second. And I on purpose didn't put all these scriptures up on, on, on the 
slides this morning because I'm going to go through a whole bunch of scriptures, single lines and, and, and comments, okay? And if any of them you want references to, touch base with me, I'll get you a copy and we'll do that. But I, I, I'd like you to just kind of go along with me on this conversation as we go through this, okay? So Luke, when he writes his gospel, he says something that's current and relevant for me and you right now. He says, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Luke is telling me and you that I looked this out, I researched it, I, I did the detail look, okay? And then he says, I decided to write an orderly account. So that means what he's going to write is not only what happened, what he investigated, what he found out, but he's going to put it in a chronological format for me and you. And then he tells us why, right there at the beginning of Luke. He says, so that you may know the certainty of the things that have been taught. And this word certainty is something I want you to focus on with me for just a minute. The word certainty. Listen to what he writes in, in Luke chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, patriarch of Galilee. He has just nailed some things down for me and you. I mean, put them down in fact. He says, there was a man by the name of Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius Caesar, he was a ruler of Rome. He was a ruler of Rome right after Caesar Augustus. And he says there was this man, Pontius. We've heard that name before you at, in Scripture. That one probably sticks out to you. He was the governor of Judea, and Herod was over the region of Galilee. Let's go a little further. His brother Philip was patriarch of Ithera and Traconus, and Licinius, and Licinius, patriarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas. Okay. I told you I have a DVR at home. I love that thing. It is so much fun. You can set it to record something, and it'll record it every week, all the time. You can set it to record a Chiefs game or whatever you want, and it'll record it. And you know what is so cool about it? When you're sitting there watching the game, and a commercial break comes on, you know what you can do? And it's gone. You can either hit the button one time, sometimes, and, and the 30-second commercial's gone. But if you hit it just right, sometimes the whole thing disappears. It's so cool. And I got to thinking, you know, there's sometimes when we read text like this, we read this kind of text, that's exactly what we do. We just hit the button and go right on past them. We miss it. You see, I just got to thinking, you know, we have Christmas pageants and Christmas programs and things. Have you ever heard an angel or a shepherd say, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Euthyra, and Traconis, and Lysirius, tetrarch of Abilene. We don't ever have those little shepherds learn those words, do we? We just skip right over them. But the reality is, the reality is in this text, there's something very, very, very extraordinary happening. What Luke is saying to me and you, and this is so current in our time right now, he's saying, fact check me. Pull it up on Snoops. Look it over. See if this isn't real. Pay attention to what I'm saying. He's not telling us this isn't something like a long time ago in a galaxy far away. He's not saying, I'm going to tell you something that May have happened, may not. I'm just here to tell you a story. That's not what he's saying at all. And he's not saying something like once upon a time in a, in a place that you've heard of. He's not here to create or manufacture something and create a story, an illusion. He's telling us right now what I'm getting ready to tell you happened. This is history. These are facts. So he does something really kind of marvelous when he, when he gets into this, into this context. He says for me and you, he lays it out. This man was the emperor of Rome. He was in charge of the known world in reality. Okay? This, this next person, he, they were the governors of Judea and Galilee. Who was in charge in that area? And underneath those were those sub-governors, those little, you know, the, the, the city councilmen and those people that are in charge of everything. And he gets clear down to where he says, and the high priest and the temple in Jerusalem. And then he says something. Here's what he says. Luke chapter 3. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. The word of God. When all that was happening, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. John was a real man, a real person. Luke goes on to say what he did in verse 3. He went into all the country around the Jordan. And then Matthew chimes in from his chapter 3. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. What, we're, what we see when you start putting all those things together, this just wasn't some crazy gay like me out preaching out in the middle of nowhere. Something was happening. They, he was down on the riverbanks of the Jordan and he was preaching and something was happening. What we find out what was happening was that all of Jerusalem 
And not only all of Jerusalem, the city, all of Judea, a region, an area. And all those people who covered and reached within the Jordan River Valley, they were, they were coming in to see this. What, what, what he's telling us is this is a Black Friday sales event on steroids. This is huge. Everybody is coming there to get a piece of this. Everybody wants to know what this man is selling. This is hot stuff. We want to find out what's going on. So this is the deal to get. Thousands, thousands of people are coming out there to the place. And this place that we're talking about, it wasn't like being here. This place was hard to get to. This was a difficult place to get to. For example, if you were in Jerusalem and you wanted to go out to the Jordan River Valley where we're talking about, you got up very early in the morning and you walked all day. And if you were lucky, you got there in time before sunset because in the next morning when you woke up, you're going to have to look up and down the river valley to figure out where he's at in the middle of all this. To put it in today's term, this would be like me and you getting up real early in the morning, getting in the car, and driving all the way to Denver to go to a concert or something. That kind of a thing. So many people gathering and being around out here in the middle of nowhere. Well, so here he is. He's... He's out on the banks of the Jordan River. He's beginning to preach, beginning to teach. Thousands and thousands of people are beginning to come in. And this creates a problem. This is a big problem. Because, because you see in, in Judea and Galilee and that area, every once in a great while, someone would rise up and they'd be a, a wannabe Messiah. A wannabe Messiah. And, and whenever that wannabe Messiah would rise up, it was a problem for the Jewish leaders. Because they would have to get into the middle of the situation, calm things down, slow things down, because if they didn't calm it down, if they didn't slow it down, Rome would get involved. And when Rome got involved, it was, it was going to get bloody. You know, the, the, the Roman governors would say, hey, either you get these people under control or we will put them under control. You won't like the way we will do the control, but we will make it happen. In fact, what's kind of interesting is during this time period, in this period in history, this is kind of a, a good thing for King Herod and his sons. In this period of time, Herod and his sons had managed to manage those situations where it had been relatively peaceful for some period of time. But now, all of a sudden, out, out in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness, on the banks of this Jordan River, is this man, John, and he's preaching thousands and thousands of people are coming to hear him. Coming to hear what he's got to say. But what's, what, what's even more troubling wasn't just that they were going out there to check it out. They were actually doing something when they got there. Matthew chapter 3 says when they got there, you know what they were doing? You ready? They were confessing their sins. They were confessing their sins. You and I hear that in the 21st century and it's like, oh, a pair of blue jeans. No big deal. That's not the truth. Confessing your sins in the first century for the Jewish people had an order. It had a structure. It had a way that it happened. You see, in, 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 all throughout their history, the Jewish people, when you, wanted, when you wanted to confess your sins, you went through this methodology, this process of how you confess your sins. If you lived anywhere in around the vicinity of Jerusalem, if you wanted to confess your sins, where'd you go? You went to Jerusalem to confess your sins. And when you got to Jerusalem, you, you tried to get into the temple and interact with the temple. And somehow you, you brought an offering or a sacrifice for the sin you had done. And if you weren't sure exactly how it all was to play out, you, you interacted with a priest or the high priest, even in some senses. And you, you, you worked with them to figure out, okay, this is what I did that was wrong. This is what the law says. So this is what I do. These are the hoops I've got to jump through so I can be forgiven. But regardless of how you did it, whether you were close to Jerusalem and you went into the temple, or whether you were a Jew at large someplace, you still went to the synagogue or someone. You went and found someone in charge. If you're going to confess your sins, you had to find someone in charge and confess, someone in authority to confess them to. And, and, and then you jump through the hoops to have, make that all happen. In fact, some religions today are still that way. But here we are. We're out on the river banks, the River Jordan, and there's this nobody out there, this man named John. He's in the middle of nowhere. He's in the wilderness, remember? And so all over the region, people are coming into him. They're confessing their sins. Things are happening. And then, it, and then the tension, Matthew builds on it a little more. Because Matthew says in chapter 3, 
confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, remember what I said about baptism? If you were going to get baptized, you had to have permission. You couldn't get, now you, you could baptize yourself, you could wash yourself, but these, these people were getting baptized not for those reasons. They were going out there getting baptized, getting washed, and they were already Jews. They were already the chosen people. And there they were out there getting baptized by this person. So the reason this is so de destructive, the reason this was so hard to, to grasp their head around is because here's this John. He's a nobody. He has no authority. He has no backing. He has virtually no education. And this wild-eyed, crazy preacher is preaching, and people are going out there. Well, John, John wrote something about this when he wrote his gospel. In the book of John, John wrote something about, about this. In the scriptures in John chapter 1, it says, he came, whoops, he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. So here's John the Apostle. John wrote his gospel in his older age, okay? And he's an older man looking back, reflecting on his life with Jesus Christ. And he's putting his, trying to put his head around the idea that this man, this person that he sat and ate with, drank with, walked with, this physical person that he looked at and talked to, there was something about him that was different. There was something inside of him that changed things. This light that was inside of him. So, John goes on to describe what John the Baptist is doing. In John 1.15, it says, John testified concerning him. He cried out, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. If you and I were to squeeze down, homogenize, get John's message, John the Baptist's message in, in a nutshell, you know what it would be? That's the one. That's the one. This, this, that's the one. This is the one. This is the one that was here before I got here. This is the one that's greater than me. This is the one that when he comes on the stage, it's going to be an amazing event. Okay? John the apostle foreshadows a little bit. He says, for the law was given through Moses... For the law was given through Moses. Now, in this time period, the law was everything. The law came through Moses. In the first century, and even today, but in, especially in the first century, the law was housed in the temple. It was sacred. It was protected. It was guarded. People died to protect the law. Uh, it, it was in a place where, in fact, in the Holy of Holies, and, and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And even there, he only went in once a year. And tradition has it that when he went in there, they tied a rope on his ankle. So that if he got in there and he died, you know what could happen? They could drag him out because nobody else was going in there to get him. The law was everything. You know, the, in, the, in, this, in this context, rabbis could teach about the law. The rabbis could comment on the law. But the teachers, they couldn't make new laws. The law was the way Moses got it from God. And so the gospel writer, he's speaking about this, and, he's, and he says, looking back, finishing verse 17, 117, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Big contrast, something new. He, John is saying there's something new happening. This is not a, an and, this is an instead of. You're going to take out the law, and you're going to put in this grace and truth. Well, when the leaders sought John the Baptist out, to figure this out, what did he say? So here's what John said. Now this is John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him. Whoops. Whoop. Whoop. There we go. A while ago, things went sour. Okay. So here he is. He's out on the water, out by the water. Give get my verse back in my head. And so this is John's testimony of when the Jewish leaders in, the Le in, in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. Okay? So get the picture. It's a, it's a Black Friday sales event out on the River Jordan. Everybody's out there, and the temple is empty. There's nothing going on at the temple. It's quiet. So the leaders realize they've got to go figure this out. Got to go check this out and see what this guy is selling. So here's what John the Baptist says. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. 
John was out there. He was preaching. He was baptizing. And, and things are going on, but he's saying, I'm not the Messiah. So, so kind of get the picture in your mind of how this is happening. Here's, here's John. He's, he's down the river. He's looking up, and there's these dark-robed figures, these men, coming down through the crowds, kind of working their way through people. And as they're coming down, you know, people are kind of stepping aside because these, these leaders, they were the ones with authority. They were the ones with the clout, you know. They're coming out here. They're, they're going to ask John who you are. Who are you, John? Are you a wannabe Messiah? That's what they're wanting to find out. Uh, are, you, are you going, we're, we're going to have to take you, John. You're going to have to come in Jerusalem. We have questions that we want answered. Okay. Well, John knows what they're after. He knows what's going to be asked. And that's why he confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. And so they ask him then, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you Elijah? Why would they say Elijah? Well, let's pull them clear back in the last prophet. The last prophet in the, in the Old Testament, his name was Malachi. And in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, it reads, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Well, John said, John the Baptist, I'm not. Well, if you're not Elijah, then, then are you the next new thing for our nation? Are you, you know, it's been 400 years and we haven't heard anything from God, so God must have something going on. Are you the next prophet? Are you the next new thing? And John, no, no. Well, then they, then they have this problem. They couldn't go back and tell people in charge who he's not. So we've got to figure this out. Let's, let's just change our, our sentence. Let's get down to this. So finally they ask him, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? What they were asking to say about yourself, what they were asking was, okay, John, whose authority are you using? You know, who's... Who's backing you up? Who's making this happen? People, you know, John, people don't come down to the river banks to confess sins. They do all that back in Jerusalem. You know, when people are, are doing things and being involved with God, they do it at the temple, John. They don't do it down here. You're out here in the river basin walking around in the mud. You're like a, you're like a walking, talking temple, John. That's not right. Well, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. John said, I'm a nobody. I'm just not going to be the guy. I'm not the guy. I'm just some kind of voice. I'm out here in the wilderness. I'm, I'm telling you to get ready. Be ready for something new. God is about to do his next big thing in you. I'm just, I'm just a warm-up act. I'm nothing. But God, the Lord, when he comes on the scene, when he's involved in your life, people with pure hearts, they'll recognize him. They'll know what he's up to. People with pure hearts who are looking for him, who are ready to repent, they'll see him. Those who've opened their hearts, those who've opened their minds, they're going to find that something new. They'll be the ones that'll recognize God. Well, but the leaders went a little further. Because you see, there was this problem with this thing he was doing. So now the Pharisees, and this is in John 1, 24. Now the Pharisees who had and sent, questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Why are you doing this, John? Why are you baptizing? If you're not the Messiah, if you're not Elijah, why prophet? This, this baptism thing, you know, if we could just get rid of this baptism thing, you know, why would you baptize people, John? Don, John, don't you know, don't you know why you're doing this? John said, yeah, I baptize with water. John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. You haven't seen anything yet. He's coming. Something new. He's the one who comes after me. John 1, 27. He's the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Look at this crowd on the river, he's saying. Look at this crowd. You think this crowd is big? Thousands and thousands of people? This is nothing. He's God. He's coming, and I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. So these leaders go back. Take it back. They probably got more questions than they do answers, didn't they? We know who he's not. We can tell him, tell him that. We, we kind of know who he says. I don't know about that reason that he gave us, you know. So they get back. Those leaders get back. And so the leaders, they decide to go down and find out what's going on for themselves. Probably not a good move on their part. Because, you see, 
this, this group didn't normally get out of Jerusalem a whole lot. So can you imagine this entourage, just caravan structure, they're going to travel all day, so we've got to get our party snacks and our, 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 our padded seats and everything else we're going to have to have. We're going to travel. We're going to go in luxury. We're going down there because, you know, this is kind of like the high priest. You know, he's, he's the guy, remember, went in the Holy Holy. All these guys, they're going out there to see what's going on. So can't you just see them up on the riverbank? Because, you know, riverbanks kind of flow down, don't you? You know, the river's at the bottom. The river's not at the top of the hill. The river's down the valley. Coming over across the hill, can't you just see? Hey, look there. There they're coming. They're coming over the river. <sighs> kind of making their way through the crowd. Getting, I don't, pardon me, pardon me. You know, thousands of people, it takes a little bit to get through them. You know, and you, as they're working through them, can't you see somebody might go, oh, this, these, ooh, these are big guys. Oh, yeah. These are, these are important people. You know, John, he sees them looking. He looks up on the hill and he sees them and kind of winding through the hill. And he, you know, it's almost like a snake when you, when you think about it. Kind of following each other, working a path to get down there. These folks don't travel outside of Jerusalem. They don't normally come out here, but here they are. They've come out here in the middle of nowhere to talk to this man named John. I don't know about you, but you, that's recognition. Not just from the people, when the leadership of everybody's in charge comes to see what God's doing. What's up? Think about the, the contrast. John the Baptist, been out there in the middle of nowhere for a long time. Now, he'd been in the river baptizing people, so he, he, he might have been okay, but you know, he could have smelled a little funny wearing camel's hair. You know, I don't know about you, but I, it doesn't say he chewed the camel's hair to make it soft. And I don't know about you, but if you take an old hide, it don't matter what you do with it. When you get it wet, oh, it does not smell good, okay? Can't you see this old wet camel's hair garment hanging over this guy? Hair, I'm sure, just kind of pushed back. And up walks these individuals, dressed clean, shiny, maybe even perfumed a little bit. Quite a contrast. So what does John do? Matthew tells us a little bit. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, coming to where he was baptizing them. He said, you brood of vipers, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? You know, nobody probably talks to those folks this way. You know, these were the, these were the holiest of holies at this point. These, these people, it was their, their full-time job. Their life's goal was just to be good people. To do the right things. To be what God wanted them to be. And God, whatever God says, let's figure it out. Let's do it. Let's, let's figure out how we can do it even more. Let's do it all we can. Let's do it. That was these people's goal. And John just calls them, you brood of vipers. Before they even got down there. You know why? He says, because he knew why they were coming. They weren't coming to be baptized, were they? He knew why they were coming. They weren't coming there to repent. To find out what was going on. He said, there's another reason that you're coming here. The reason you're coming here is because you're afraid of the, the wrath. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? So John goes back to him a little deeper. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Not the kind of repentance that you do off in a room by yourself, where nobody pays the attention, maybe nobody knows. I want you to be able to produce repentance that has fruit. Repent in a way that everybody can see it. Well, the tension is building up. Because what was going about to happen was... Things were going to change. There wasn't going to be this uncompassionate religion any longer. You know, this kind of religion where someone is sick, someone is dying, someone has failed, something has, has, has come devastating in your life, and people tell you, well, just offer this sacrifice, do this thing, but we're too busy with the law to really pay attention to you. Something was changing. Well, in this moment, after this has happened, they leave. And we're at that moment, that moment in time when something new it's going to happen. Something new is about to happen. John chapter 128 says, This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. Something new was on the horizon. John sees Jesus. Jesus sees John. They know each other. They're aware of each other. This, this, this encounter that's about to happen has never been like this before. Never like this. Something 
undo. A transition was going to happen in the world because what was going to happen was Jesus was going to step into the pages of history as God. Something the world had never experienced. We, we, we celebrate Christmas, and that's important, we should, because that was when he was born. But this moment in time, when he steps in here with John, is when things begin to happen. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, a believer or a non-believer, this moment changed time. But you know, when you think about this moment, there was Jesus and there was John. Two men. Two guys down on the River Jordan. You realize how fragile that moment was? In this time period in history, people were born, lived, died, killed, murdered, sold into slavery, destroyed, wiped out. And nobody knew it. It happens all the time. And this moment in time is so fragile. Here in the water. It's two men. So intimate. You know what John says when he sees Jesus? What he says is look. He doesn't say imagine. He doesn't say believe. He doesn't say pretend or, or hope. He says look. He tells us to figure. To, to literally do something. Look. The Lamb of God. The Lamb that was given to Abraham to save his son. That Lamb, that Lamb has been promised. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Whoa, wait a minute, John. These thousands and thousands of people out here, they're getting baptized? Take away the sin of the world. Wait, whoa, whoa, John, wait a minute. This is cool. You've been doing some good things, but not... John, did you get that right? Take away the sin of the world? You mean my enemies? You're here to take their sins away? The Roman sin. You're going to take Roman sin away, John? This, this lamb can do that? Everyone. So then, John, why? Uh, that doesn't make sense, John. Because see, all along, we, we've, been, we've been part of God's people. And we, and we, we don't eat their food. We don't, we don't wear their clothes. We don't marry their, their daughters. And we don't let our sons... Their sons marry our daughters. We, we don't go in their house. They don't go in our house, John. We, we, we want to be separate. Okay, why this? See, they were waiting for a Messiah like Joshua who's going to come and destroy, wipe out, take all the sin out of the world. Okay, that's what they understood. Sin would all be gone. God is saying the sin's going to be gone, but the people aren't going to be here. Jesus is the bridge between the two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. He's the bridge between two value systems, two different law systems, two different whole world views. Uh, you remember when, when Abraham was around, which is long, long, long before the days of Jesus, long before, centuries before. God told Abraham that the whole world, would, the entire world would be blessed. That's what's about to happen right now. The nation of Israel lost sight that they were a temporary means for an eternal end. Well, the end has come. God's finally going to do what he's going to do. So he's this bridge between the two covenants, born under the old to introduce the new. So quite often those folks who want to hang on to the old are the ones who are benefiting the most from it and getting the most out of it, at least inclined to let it go. So when Jesus stepped onto the pages of history, the temple system was really a very wealthy, lucrative program. It was nice the way it was working. In fact, when you look at it, Jesus never had a whole lot favorable to say about the temple, did it? But ultimately, even that temple that was there to promote God and do God joined with Rome, joined with the world to condemn him and crucify him. But this isn't the end. Jesus came to establish a new covenant, a new relationship, a new agreement between us and God. He let, if, you, if, you, uh, if you read things in the Old Testament, sometimes it's hard to, to reconcile. How could this God in the Old Testament be this God in the New Testament? How could that be? What Jesus would say to you is, this, this is the new God. This is, this is God as he was, God as he is, but this is how he relates to us in the world now. The old is done, the new has come. A new command. You know, Moses went up on the mountain and got a, got a list of laws and order of how people were to live and function and, and, and set them down and people got them. When, if you remember how Jesus taught, Jesus would say words like, you heard it said, but I say. You heard it said, but I say. Jesus took 600 different plus commandments, condensed them down to two, and even those two, he condensed down to one. 
Okay? And this, this new movement. A new movement. That's the third thing he came to start in place. And that's me and you. The church. Us. Okay? So can't you just see that moment, that day, down there at the river? Jesus makes his way down the water. John's there. He's baptizing people. And Jesus says, okay, John, baptize me. And John looks at him like, no, 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 no. You know, I, I just told everybody I'm a nobody. I just told everybody that I am insignificant. I just told them I'm not worthy to untie your sandals. Jesus wanted to be sure that he was identified with that this movement. This thing is going on. This, this bringing something new into the world. John said that, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. On a dark Friday afternoon, about 2,000 years ago, that happened for me and you. Jesus completed that. He died for me. He died for you. He died for the Jews. He died for the Gentiles. He died for Rome. He died for the world. But it wasn't the beginning. It was something new. If you're here today, let me, let, me, let me condense this down real short. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, here's what's going on in your world, 2020, 2021, 2022. You hear the word new to the point that it's diluted. It's not real. And that's because we've got to where we think of new as just something we haven't had before. I got a new truck the other day. It's a 2008 model, okay? The deceiver has taken the word new and diluted it to the point that you think when someone talks to you about Jesus, it's a lie. It isn't real. This man, Jesus, couldn't have stood in the water like that with this man named John. This man named Jesus, he's just not capable of understanding all the sin I have in my life. This man named Jesus couldn't do that. He is. He is God in the flesh. There is no sin in your life. No turmoil he can't handle. No problem. So today you can really start 2022 new. A new you've never experienced. But if you're someone who's walked along that riverbank a while. You know. Riverbanks get muddy. And they get hard to walk in. As Christians... I want you to realize he creates every day new for me and you. Every time I fall short, which is quite often, every time I stumble and fail, his blood is sprinkled over me, we're told. In the book of 1 Peter, we talked about that in class this morning, and that applies so truthfully. Because every day I fall short, every day I fumble, every day I mess up, his blood is sprinkled over me. And I'm a new creature. I'm a new person. And I'm going to strive harder, and I'm going to try stronger, and I'm going to do all I can for him to have someone to find that they can have that intimate moment where they step in the water with Jesus Christ. Because when you go into that water, and you're buried with him in baptism, you come up out of that new. New. You have never, ever experienced that if you haven't experienced it. Let's all stand and sing.